A reading from the Gospel of Luke. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So where were you 15 years ago? On this date, I mean. It seems to me there are a few dates in all of our histories when we know where we were. If you're old enough, you probably remember the day Pearl Harbor, Harbor was bombed, right? If you're old enough, you probably remember the day John F. Kennedy was assassinated here in Dallas. If you're old enough, you might remember the day Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Maybe the day Bobby Kennedy was killed. Or the Challenger blew up. 9-11 was one of those days like that. For those of us who were alive on it, we can't forget. It was a day a group of radical Islamic terrorists flew hijacked planes into the Twin Tower buildings in New York City, killing thousands. They flew a plane into the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. And because of the bravery of some, another just went into an empty field in Pennsylvania. In every case, our first reaction to that and all these other tragedies was shock and grief. But right behind them was anger and a desire for revenge. We wanted those perpetrators caught and we wanted them dead. We wanted justice, which was right, but over time it sometimes becomes difficult to distinguish our desire for justice from our need for revenge. And what has our 15-year find and destroy campaign wrought? We've seen an escalation in hatred and death a growing threat of terrorists and perpetual fear of others who look like they could be, whether there's any good reason to believe that or not. At our best, maybe we look at these people as misguided and lost souls. Sometimes we see them as pure evil, along with everyone who looks like them, worships like them, and cheered them on. And in doing so, I tell you, the danger to us is just as great. That is, that we forget just how much hatred and lostness exists within each of us and how different God's way of dealing 
with us in Jesus Christ has been. It reminds me of the story of the teacher who addressed her primary school class one day and said, boys and girls, if everyone in this classroom who was good was painted green and bad was painted red, what color would you be? They all sort of looked at each other for a while, and then one little boy popped up and said, striped. (laughs) And that's true, isn't it? We are all of us striped, good and bad, none of us unstriped, not one or the other. We are all beloved children of God who are all at the very same time dreadfully lost sinners. So Jesus tells three parables in Luke chapter 15, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, more commonly known as the prodigal son, which follows this passage that we read today. We'll get to that another day. We'll refer to it a bit. And actually, I would tell you that I think the first two of these parables help us better to interpret the prodigal son parable. But too often we have read these parables in a way that misses the point. I want to suggest to you today that the point of the parables is the conclusion of each one, and that is that there is great joy in heaven over everyone who is lost that is found. Great joy. But most of us instead have read these parables as stories of repentance, as we understand repentance, which is almost always the repentance of other people, don't you know? I think of it, right? We think we are the ones who are already safe, like the 99 sheep or the nine coins. We're doing all the right things for God. The one sheep that wanders off and the one coin that somehow slips away are the random sinners out there who are not like us. And when we read it that way, I tell you, I think we miss so much of what Jesus is trying to teach us about the joy of God. So let's take a fresh look at these parables. Note the setting in the first verses. Jesus is consorting with tax collectors and sinners, eating with them even. They are drawn to him, his welcome of them, his love for them, his simple willingness to be with them as they are. And when he does, the insiders, the Pharisees in this case in Jesus' day, the religious insiders, and let's be honest, good church folk in our day, right, begin to grumble about his inappropriate attention to them and identification with them. So let's just state the obvious. You can't feel joy while you are busy grumbling. Let's just test that for a moment. I want you to think right now of something that seems just so wrong to you. I want you to think about a grievance you have, about some feeling of injustice, some person who has done you wrong, something cruel or embittering. And if you need to, go ahead and put a face on it. Shouldn't be too hard around here these days. Now, I want you to listen to the singing of the angels in heaven. Are you feeling it? No. You can't do that, see? Because, see, your heart can't enjoy a party that your mind will not let you attend. Right? You can't celebrate the good news of God in Jesus Christ 
if you assign yourself the role of telling Jesus what he must do or not do, where he must go or not go, with whom he may be or not be. Joy is what you get when you join Jesus in his search and recover mission in the world. So, here we have a shepherd who finds that one sheep has wandered off. Notice, that sheep was already the property of the shepherd. We have a coin that slips away. Notice, that coin was already the property of the woman. Never stop being so. The sheep and the coin were included first, before they were lost. Which means lostness is not about exclusion from God, it is about losing the experience of knowing who you really are to God. See? These parables show us that from the point of view of Jesus, inclusion is a starting point, not an ending point. The shepherd does not have a flock of 99 sheep and go looking for one more to make 100. I'm just saying. The woman does not have nine coins and go looking for one more to make 10. They were all the property of their owner to begin with. And when the searcher goes to find them, it is only to restore what is already true. In 1947, the Norwegian explorer and ethnographer Tor Heyerdahl conducted an extraordinary experiment called the Kantiki Expedition. Heyerdahl had this notion that before Columbus even sailed for the New World, the South Americans had the capacity to explore on their own and to even get to Polynesia with the primitive technologies that they had at the time and that they might have actually successfully done so and the cultures influenced one another. So to prove his theory, they, he determined to set out on a voyage and use and build a raft made only of pre-Columbian Peruvian materials, balsa logs being the foundation of the raft, and modeled it after illustrations that they found of Spanish conquistador ships. So they built this raft. They set out on a journey that would be successful. Heyerdahl and five companions. It was a 101-day journey covering 4,300 miles until they landed in Polynesia. The problem along the way is that they had little capacity to control the raft, where it went and how it got there. They were controlled mainly by the weather, the wind and the waves. And that meant that if something fell overboard, there was no going after it because they couldn't stop and turn the raft around. That included people. Two-thirds of the way along the journey, Herman Watzinger lost his footing and fell overboard. He immediately began trying to swim to catch up to the raft, but the crew was desperate, realizing that it was going too fast and he could never do so. So they got the life belt and they began to try to throw it to him, but the wind kept blowing it back to them. And so the, it, they were beginning to despair of the futility of ever being able to get their crew member back until Newt Haugland just grabbed that belt and tied it around his waist and dove into the water and went and swam to Herman, grabbed him in his arms, and they began to make their way back and the crew pulled them into the raft and he was saved. Note, they did not lecture Herman while he was in the water and tell him what a fool he was for having lost his footing and you just have to get what you deserve. One man actually risked his whole life to go save him and there was joy on the raft 
when he returned. When I think of the story of that expedition, I think about the shepherd who leaves the 99 and goes to find the lost sheep, and the woman who leaves the nine coins and goes to find the lost one. And I think about the God who leaves the angels in heaven and goes to save the lost of the earth by sending us Jesus to be the Savior of the world. And what it cost him to do it. What Jesus does is to model for us the heart of a God which isn't striped. God sends Jesus to seek and to save the lost, not to huddle up safely with the saved and teach us how to keep ourselves from falling. In doing so, he identifies with the lost entirely. Because in the end, my friends, that's the whole world, including us. He accepts in doing so that his reputation among the holy will be tarnished by consorting with sinners and loving them unconditionally. And he understands his mission this way and actually gives himself up entirely on the cross for that goal. This story Luke tells us about Jesus' parables is not just an interesting story that Jesus told one day to some religious insiders that were challenging him grumbling about his outreach to sinners. It's a story Luke tells a generation later to his own church and to every church of every time, including one whose mission statement says that they wish to build a community of faith shaped by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The mission of the church is not to protect ourselves against sinners or to keep ourselves from them because that would always mean we would fail since we ourselves are always striped with good and evil. We are never not sinners. No matter how saintly we seem. Did you hear the Apostle Paul say, I am the chief of sinners, not I was. The only way we can fulfill our mission as a church is to be on a search and recover mission with Jesus rather than the search and destroy mission that some in the world would have or the stay safe and guard the homeland mission that we would prefer. We have good news to share with sinners because we know it personally. If we remember it. But they will never hear it from us if they think we are condescendingly telling them that if they would only do first what we have done so that they can become like us, then they will be welcome among us, then they will be welcome with God, and all will be well. If you want to know the reason why so many young people don't care a fig about the church this, these days, that's it. They view us as hypocrites who spend all our time trying to decide how to protect ourselves and our community of holiness against anyone who would threaten it with their sinner status. And all the while, they know what we won't admit about ourselves, namely that we are as lost as they are. Even if we are insiders to the church and they are outsiders. My great-grandfather on my father's side worked on the water like my father and my grandfather. He came over from Great Britain on a ship that he was working on. 
and he worked on the docks in New York. He died there too. On a dock in New York. Hmm. We think he was probably drunk one night when he was headed back from a gin mill to the ship. He probably lost his footing on some loose boards on the dock, and he went down. He went down under the pier. Nobody could see him. He'd been knocked unconscious by the fall, and we think he was there for probably about two weeks before they found him because his fingernails had grown out that much. He was wedged between some pilings under the pier. The official cause of death was drowning. A sailor drowned at the dock. I believe these parables of Jesus are less about the supposed sinners than the supposed saints. They're about the church that can be lost even in church. They're about the church that has forgotten its own lostness and its mission to seek and to save, our reason for being. Did you notice that when the shepherd finds the sheep, he doesn't go back to the 99? And when the woman finds the coin, she just doesn't go back and throw it in the coin box with the others? Instead, she calls together all of her friends to help, for, for them to come and help her celebrate and rejoice. Why do that? If not that the 99 and the 1 probably were in no mood to celebrate. I believe that they represent the church as I think Luke is telling us We've forgotten how to celebrate salvation because we've forgotten our own lostness and what it cost Jesus to find us. Okay, but what about repentance, George? Doesn't it say over one sinner that repents? And isn't therefore the key to joy really repentance? Well, how does a sheep repent? How does a coin repent? And if you want to point me to the prodigal, I'm just not so sure that his decision to return home was about repentance. Repentance is not so much feeling sorry for our sins as it is agreeing with God about who we really are. When we repent, we acknowledge our lostness and we celebrate our being found. We don't confess our sins in order to warrant forgiveness and acceptance into the fold. We confess that we belong to God and then we are able to enjoy our true identity and celebrate with God. When you break it down, the anatomy of joy then is found in being found. That's it. The experience of being found. And then of going and finding others who are as lost as we know ourselves to be. Joy comes from being in the arms of God and celebrating every lost sinner who is saved, including us. The alternative, of course, is that we stay where we are and we stay as we are. And we grumble over God's acceptance of sinners. I don't know about you. I'd rather share God's joy. Amen.